Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator So I'm going to show you, these are some of the faces of interdisciplinary dentistry and specifically SFOT that I've had the opportunity to, to work on over the years. Um, you'll notice all sizes, shapes, um, basically ages from mid to late 60s, early 70s, all the way down to 13, 14 years old. And today, um, this is just a part of interdisciplinary practice. It's a strong part of my practice, and it's probably one of the most rewarding things that, that I do. Uh, this is a good example to start with, you know, so this patient comes into the practice and, you know, you're thinking, okay, do they have enough inner root separation for implant placement at the number 10 position? Do they have enough bone volume to accommodate implant position? It appears that the pink aesthetics are in a relatively good position. But what has happened over the years is that we've gone from two-dimensional planning to three-dimensional planning, and three-dimensional planning really allows us to start to look at the bigger question and start to answer things that we didn't have an opportunity to think about before. So it's allowing us to, 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 to think bigger and to ask more core-based problems. And so the question for this particular patient, when you start to meet the, you know, when you meet them for the initial exam, isn't so much, do I have enough room to put an implant in? Can I do this flapless? Can I do an immediate provisional? All this stuff, that's really myopic and kind of simple thinking. The, the thinking really, when you come to CBCT planning, because we're taking a different viewing lens now is why are the teeth set up in that position? Why are we camouflaging a class two skeletal malocclusion um, and leaving the patient with the lower incisors dumped forward like this when they really should be decompensated and a lower jaw surgery performed? If we're gonna do that, however, uh, there may not be enough bone to put the teeth in the right position to make that happen. And so this really allows us, imaging is really what's allowing us to ask bigger questions and to set an even playing field across, um, across the care of our patients. So today what we're going to talk about is dental alveolar and alveoloskeletal bone engineering. That's really what this is, expanding the limits and reversing the risks. So I want to just kind of start off with Steve. Steve is a class one malocclusion patient, comes in with upper moderate crowding and lower severe crowding. And this is basically how he presented to my office. Now, the orthodontist is basically, you know, doing what they do. They're basically moving the teeth and they, they're coming into a problem in the lower incisors. He's got crowding. That's hallmark, sim number, that's hallmark symptom number one. If you have a patient with crowding, they do not have enough bone to accommodate all the teeth. And so this orthodontist is having a little bit of a problem accommodating all the teeth. And it's the restorative dentist that basically says, hey, what's going on here? You know, this patient is starting to have mucogingival deficiencies. There's problems with the teeth. And the orthodontist who's kind of a, in his practice says, well, that's no problem. We'll just, we'll just take out the lower incisor. No big deal. Just take the lower incisor and just keep on moving. Well, that wasn't part of the problem. That wasn't part of the plan when Steve signed up for orthodontic treatment. Steve didn't sign up to have his teeth taken out. Steve signed up to have his teeth saved and to have a better situation for his long-term health, not only for his dental health, but his periodontal health. And so we're not going to just cavalier go extracting teeth anymore and making the box smaller. We want to expand the arch forms and we want to save teeth. And so this is what we're going to end up doing. This is the um, this is the anatomy, and you can see that clearly the dental alveolar deficiencies here. You can see the pro, the proclination of some of these teeth, and the fact that there just isn't enough bone to accommodate teeth. Is soft tissue grafting enough to basically just allow the orthodontist to continue to move the teeth? 
Not in today's world, because we have the information from the CBCT telling us that the it's not a soft tissue deficiency problem. Certainly there is a soft tissue deficiency here, but at the core of the matter is a bone deficiency. So we're going to do some bone augmentation to accommodate the teeth to create a bigger envelope of bone with which the teeth can be moved in. But we need to do it in a soft tissue environment that will allow that bone to heal properly. And so having a mucosal margin is not the ideal um, anatomy for that. So the first thing we're going to do is just simply do a uh, soft tissue phenotype augmentation procedure today, uh, which would obviously be known as a free gingival graft, straightforward soft tissue graft surgery, and remove his maxillary anterior frenum. There will be no bone augmentation done on the maxillary arch because it's simply not needed. And we'll go from a situation like you see on the left to a situation like you see on the right, a situation that is much more conducive to uh, periodontal regeneration and bone augmentation to accommodate the teeth. This is the surgery. We do a large flap surgery in the lower arch. We do our corticotomies uh, in between the teeth and our dental alveolar decortication. That's what you see with the little dimples there. We do bone grafting to, to facilitate periodontal regeneration. This will be done with a cancellous allograft first. The cancellous allograft is the, my uh, bone graft of choice right up against the root surface because we're trying to gain periodontal regeneration in this area. So I wanna use a graft material that's gonna vascularize fast and, uh, and uh, encourage periodontal regeneration and then the graft particles be resorbed quickly so that we end up with cementum, periodontal ligament and alveolar bone. Beyond that, I wanna have a better fortress um, for bone regeneration. I need a material that's gonna maintain space better. And so here we'll use a cortical cancellous allograft with a little bit of bioos because once bioos or a xenograft gets incorporated into the mix, as you all know, that bone is very well maintained and stable long-term as uh, the patient functions or the patient goes through mechanotransduction for many years to come. A biograide membrane will then be used to stabilize the bone graft. Fixation tacks are used to stabilize the graft and the membrane. And then the flaps will be closed with passive uh, passivity so that um, uh, it is, uh, it is, it'll heal uneventfully. This is a two week follow-up. This is a two month follow-up. And this is from the occlusal view, anterior view. And at four months, you see that we have basically got all the teeth in the correct alignment. We've not taken out any teeth. Midlines are straight. And not only do we have a beautiful soft tissue phenotype for long-term health and stability, but we haven't taken those teeth and moved them out of the bone and envelope. In fact, we've created a better bone envelope to move the teeth. And you can't do that with just alloderm soft tissue grafting. It needs to be with bone regeneration. How about using aligners? Well, this is an example of an older patient who's going to be going through orthodontic treatment. She wants to look better. She wants her teeth to be aligned, um, but she's going to go, she's going to elect to go through orthodontic treatment. Now, She's also missing a cuspid. She's not really missing the cuspid. In fact, the cuspid is actually uh, impacted. And you can see the compensations that have happened. When I say compensations, basically what I'm talking about is there is a generally an imbalance between the skeletal bases. So the upper jaw, the lower jaw, they don't quite align with each other. Not everybody looks like Brad Pitt or Angelina Jolie or... Um, you know, or, 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 or let's say Uvo, just a beautiful face and everybody's got this kind of perfect uh, Leonardo da Vinci kind of face alignment. Um, instead, most of us are a little bit off, if you will. So the upper jaw doesn't exactly match the lower jaw or vice versa. And so what happens? Well, when the bases don't really align properly or ideally, there are the teeth will compensate for that imbalance, right? And these are called dental compensations. And you'll notice that the maxillary premolars are kind of tipped in, if you will. And so the teeth compensate for the skeletal imbalance. And the first thing the orthodontist is going to do is going to reverse that plan. They're going to decompensate the compensations. And that will actually unmask the true skeletal etiology or diagnosis of the patient. And today we have imaging diagnostics that really clearly show this in great detail. Every time I do a scan, I try to do it in a fully seated condylar position so with a bite registration, not a bite fork that allows the patient to posture forward. We want to do a little bite registration 
put the jaw in a fully seated condylar position so that we can see the joint in the correct position. And we can also make sure we understand the relationship here properly as well. This is a larger field of view so that we can plan orthognathic surgery if that's necessary. Um, and we have a better full view of the patient. So again, first thing we're going to do is convert the phenotype here. We don't always have to do that, but in many cases we do. So first step is going to be to put a soft tissue um, uh, graft in the lower anterior. But don't be fooled because most of us who look at this say, oh, hey, that looks really good. The clinical attachment level is in good shape. Got a lot of robust soft tissue. Go ahead and move the teeth. The problem is there isn't bone to move the teeth within and the orthodontist has to move the teeth within a trough of bone, not take them out of the bone. How do they know how much bone to use? By imaging. And not, it's not enough to just use imaging. You have to use imaging that's infused in a software program that allows you to simulate those tooth movements, much like guided surgery, so you can see where the teeth are relative to the bone and can you, and you step back and determine, can I accommodate that tooth movement or is that perhaps detrimental to the patient? So here's what happens today, right? And so the, the doctor is going ahead and using an Invisalign plan and they're gonna go ahead and move the teeth and they're gonna align with an Invisalign plan and that's where we're gonna end up. And doesn't that look great? It does look great. But how stupid have we become in the profession? Let me repeat that. How stupid have we become in the profession? We're letting a cartoon direct our treatment plans. This cartoon has no rendering of factual anatomy. For me, this is like going to your physician and saying, you know what? Your blood pressure is 250. I'm going to go ahead and put you on a blood pressure medication. Well, doctor, what is it? 250 over what? Well, it doesn't matter. The diastolic number doesn't matter. We just treatment plan half the information. So here's your blood pressure medication because your blood pressure is 250. Would that ever happen in medicine? Absolutely not. And so why is this happening in dentistry? We're basically moving the crowns of the teeth. The gums are being moved through this cartoon, cartoon and we're going ahead and putting patients through this kind of treatment. There's no representation of the other 50% of the anatomy and the influence of tooth movement on the dental alveolar bone when the root is put in that position. We have no understanding if this is actually a, a good treatment plan for a patient. Now, luckily, the restorative dentist knows enough to basically, who happens to be doing this case, luckily, he knows enough to look at the scan and say, hey, there isn't enough bone to where I want to kind of move these teeth. But you have to use a more sophisticated program that allows the teeth to be visualized and the dental alveolar bone. And I'll show you that in a program called SureSmile later on. So here's the surgery to accommodate that tooth movement. We're going to go ahead and do kind of a large surgery. This is uh, in the impacted tooth here. You can see the palatally the inclined crown. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually do a lateral window sinus lift to move the Schneiderian membrane out of the way. We then cut the tooth in half here, and I'm going to deliver the root without having to perforate into the sinus. You can see that here. I've sectioned the tooth there and there. We then go ahead and remove this root tip out of the way. And then I'll go ahead and remove the, the, there you see there, and there's no sinus communication now. Um, and that's a significant amount of trauma. And that's great because we're going to use that to our advantage as a result of that particular, in, the influence of that extraction is going to certainly help our tooth movement dramatically because it's going to create a demineralized bone matrix on the surrounding anatomy, which will facilitate the tooth movement. And you can see the palatal um, aspect there, the crown is removed. So again, here's my corticotomies to induce the regional accelatory phenomena, the dental alveolar decortication to demineralize the bone matrix, and then the corticotomies as well, just like you would do for bone grafting, get it into the marrow so that the uh, stem cells and the vasculature can come from the marrow to vascularize the bone graft. Because at the end of the day, we want to set up a functional matrix around the T, something that's going to be sustainable long-term for mechanotransduction and long-term periodontal health. Membranes are placed to stabilize the graft, a little connective tissue graft there with alloderm. Same thing here on the lower. And not only am I doing my corticotomies here, but I'm actually doing a little bit more trauma here uh, in between the roots to really get that bone uh, environment demineralized so that the teeth can move much more uh, with better facilitation. So when we step back and we think about 
interdisciplinary treatment planning, the first step is to basically just say hello to the patient. And when you walk into the operatory and say hello to the patient, don't don't pick up the mirror, don't pick up the probe, don't pick up the caries explorer. Just look at the patient's face and think about what is their face telling me? Are they, do they have flat malar prominences? Are they a class three skeletal relationship? Look at the profile. Just, just look at the face and start to think from a craniofacial standpoint, what is the face telling me about what I'm probably going to end up seeing with that patient in the mouth? Um, because it starts, it starts with the jaws to face relationship. The next relationship we look at is how the jaws align to each other, how the teeth relate to the jaws and how the teeth will then relate to each other. Um, and so when all these kind of parts fit together, you usually have a very nice situation, but most of the, as I mentioned earlier, most patients don't present with a perfect skeletal relationship. And there's usually some imbalance between one of these four components. And if they're not all really addressed as an interdisciplinary plan, at some point down the road, something is going to fall awry. Either teeth are going to break and fracture, restorations aren't going to hold up, gingival recession is going to happen, tooth wear is going to occur, uh, or we just really, or an airway maybe is compromised or, we ju- or maybe not even addressed. I mean, we're just not going to get this, the same level of outcome that we could if all the pieces of the puzzle fit perfectly. And so when we think about these things, you know, historically, this is an orthognathic component. This is an orthognathic component. This is an orthodontic component. And this is a prosto and perhaps an orthodontic component. So where does the perio fit? Where does the corticotomy fit with the dental alveolar augmentation to expand the limits of orthodontic tooth movement? Well, it fits right here. To a subtle degree, it'll affect jaws to face relationship because when you bone graft the maxillary and mandibular anterior regions, you will change soft tissue B point to a small degree, not like orthodontic surgery, but to a small degree. And so when you have patients that have a significant mental labial fold, you will soften that a little bit. And my experience is that most people like it. It will definitely affect the jaws to jaw relationship, not like orthognathic surgery, but it will have a subtle relationship. So some patients that have a mild class two or a mild class, a mild class three or a mild class two, that you can do a little proclination and move the teeth a little bit, you can fudge that that skeletal imbalance a little bit. Um, and, set, and I'll show you a case of that. But really where it fits in is the teeth to jaws relationship. The patient with crowding, the patient with mucogingival problems, the patient with, uh, the, the, with the worn dentition. These really fit in nicely to expand the envelope of tooth movement and create better proportions for teeth and to make teeth actually look like teeth. And then of course the tooth to tooth relationship. The American Academy of Periodontology, which I, I was a part of, um, has put forth a best evidence consensus on on modifying gingival phenotype. And I think that's what you're going to start seeing more and more in the future is phenotype modification therapy, because it's been influenced so much by CBCT technology. And then one of the questions that was asked is, is this conversion therapy beneficial for patients receiving orthodontic treatment? So let's start with definitions, right? What do I mean when I say periodontal phenotype? When I say periodontal phenotype, I mean the gingival phenotype or the 3D volume and the bone morphotype. It's a combination term, gingival phenotype, bone morphotype, bone morphotype, meaning the thickness of the labial plate. Same thing with peri-implant phenotype. It's how much soft tissue thickness and volume do you have? And what's the bone morphotype related to those dimensions? And when we talk about phenotype conversion therapy, we're really talking about transforming a thin to a thick phenotype by integration of bone and or soft tissue augmentation. Most of the time it's bone, sometimes it's both. Very rarely is it soft tissue alone, but sometimes, again, I'm not ruling that out. Um, Why is it important? Because over 30% of patients are probably gonna develop gingival recession a short amount of time after they've had orthodontic treatment. And there's a higher incidence of bony dehiscences and gingival recession that can develop in teeth that are surrounded by a thin phenotype or if orthodontic forces are applied to move the dentition outside the alveolar process. Guys, if you're only using photographs or cephalometrics or paneros to assess your patients orthodontically, you're missing the boat and you can't tell how much bone there is to move the teeth properly. 
not in a not in an, in an accurate fashion, not in one that really is generally giving you the anatomic truth of the patient. So this is the paper uh, that I mentioned earlier, and the focus questions were: Does the modification of gingiva from a from a thick to a thin phenotype maintain health? The other focus question that we addressed at the AAP in this best evidence consensus was. What's the effect of surgically modifying soft tissue phenotype around a fixed dental prosthesis? And the one that I was kind of focused on is, does periodontal phenotype modification therapy by bone or soft tissue, does it benefit patients undergoing orthodontic treatment? And so let's look at that. Um, periodontal phenotype modification therapy by corticotomy-assisted orthodontic therapy combined with bone uh, augmentation was shown to provide benefits to patients who are undergoing orthodontic treatment. And the benefit of soft tissue grafting alone during orthodontic treatment remains a little undetermined because we just don't have a lot of studies to support that. This is an example of a patient who's going through um, a, a tooth borne expander. This is not a bone borne expander, it's a tooth borne expander. And what's interesting is the question was asked, you know, if you do rapid palatal expansion or if you do slow palatal expansion, do you lose bone around the teeth in one way or another, and in, in, in which, which do you lose more bone with? What's interesting to note is with rapid palatal expansion, you lose less bone. So most of the time we're doing slow expansion, right? That actually is more detrimental to the dental alveolar process. You can see that here compared to rapid expansion because the teeth and the bone around the teeth just don't have enough time to recover from what's happening, which is this slow kind of pushing out of the alveolar envelope. I'm not saying there isn't some remodeling, there is, but you're changing the vulnerability to a degree. And unless you're using simulation technology to know how much um, risk you're gonna end up with, you really are guessing. Okay, so let's look at this regarding orthodontic treatment. The background, orthodontic treatment may result in iatrogenic sequela in a vulnerable periodontium, such as the development of worsening bony dehiscences, fenestration, development or exacerbation of such, and or clinical manifestations of bony defects in gingival recession. Our aim was to determine is periodontal phenotype conversion therapy, which is corticotomy, orthodontic treatment that I was showing you, SFOT, does it have clinical benefits in patients undergoing orthodontic treatment? And again, a lot more research has to be done in this. But what we showed was that based on the literature, corticotomy assisted orthodontic treatment with bone augmentation did enhance tooth movement and reduced overall treatment time by as much as 50 to 60%, by the way, compared to conventional orthodontic treatment. We don't do it for expediting tooth movement though. That's not a primary reason, unless the patient wants it that way, but that's not a primary reason for doing this procedure. It's a benefit, but it's not the primary reason. No periodontal complications or evidence of severe root resorption was noted for both. In fact, less root resorption was noted. Four studies showed radiographic outcomes of uh, phenotype conversion therapy that demonstrated an increase in the radiographic density or thicker bone dimensions after treatment. And one study showed an increase in the width of keratinized gingiva post corticotomy assisted orthodontic therapy when bone grafting was used. So the conclusions of the best evidence consensus that was published in 2020, is that phenotype conversion therapy by particulate bone grafting together with corticotomy-assisted orthodontics can provide clinical benefits such as augmenting or enhancing facial bone thickness, accelerating tooth movement, expanding the scope of safe tooth movement, reducing the incidence of orthodontic relapse for mandibular and anterior teeth. And so let's look at, um, let's look at Jim. Jim is a patient with a denture. And what's nice about, so why am I talking about this with orthodontics, right? Because we're thinking interdisciplinary. And when you're thinking about interdisciplinary dentistry, you want to figure out where do the teeth need to go in this patient, in my particular patients, in their face? And what better way to start by thinking about a denture? I'm a periodontist. I'm not a prosthodontist. I didn't get an A plus in denture. That's probably why I went to perio. But my knowledge from dentures was probably undervalued because when I was taking the course, because that's where everything starts. Where did the teeth need to go in the patient's face and think about it like a denture? And that's ideal when you have a denture because you can put the tooth anywhere you want. You can warm the wax and you can put the tooth in the patient's face anywhere you want. The problem is when you have natural teeth, you've got these pesky things called roots. And those roots are coming along with the crown. You just can't put the teeth anywhere you want 
because the roots need to have available bone to support that tooth position in an ideal spot for their face, for their bite, and for the airway. And when you consider some of the studies that have been done using imaging technology by Danny Boozer's group out of Switzerland, this is a classic study by Verdrata Braut, um, uh, Urs Belzer and Danny Boozer, some of the leading people in our profession. And they looked at uh, uh, their patient population in over 500 patients from premolar to premolar that had scans. And they basically measured two points on uh, 500 patients, MP1 and MP2. MP1 is, is measured horizontal thickness of bone, four millimeters from the CEJ. How thick is the bone? MP2 is at the mid root position of, the, of teeth numbers five through 12. How thick was the bone? Okay, so there's MP1 and there's MP2. And what they found is that in over 500 patients, the average facial bone thickness was about a millimeter. 90% of patients have equal to or less than one millimeter of facial bone thickness. That's not, you know, disease. That's just normal human anatomy. And we have to respect that. Now, what's interesting about this is that if you look at this, this, a scan and you think about the patient, what do you know about this? The trajectory of the tooth root is not exactly the trajectory of the bone, is it? And so what's happened here? The tooth is compensated. Why? The tooth is probably compensated because this is likely a class two malocclusion and the tooth root has basically done this to compensate for the skeletal imbalance or the mandibular um, um, hypoplasia. Here's an example of a patient of mine. Um, she's going into law school and she would like to benefit from fast orthodontics. Sure, and most people would, but that's not why we're doing this procedure. The procedure is done to basically expand the envelope of tooth movement and that's a ton of uh, crowding in this, in this particular patient. So can I, can, I, can I grow enough bone for Susanna to not have to take teeth out? Let's ask the question. I have changed the soft tissue environment in preparation for the surgery. And the question is, here's the sure smile diagnostics. Here's the imaging diagnostics. This is what the scan looks like. And so the question is, is this tooth root really completely void and dehist like the scan says? And the reality is, no, it's not. And so the problem with our scans is while we have all this amazing technology, it still requires us to think. It still requires us our, to use our brain and tell and, and determine, is this imaging technology really telling me the correct information? So it's saying there's a dehist root surface here. And I know, because I'm showing you this intrasurgically, there isn't. But there is periodontal risk here. So this problem with the scans is that they tend to overestimate how much bone loss is there, at least in the 3D rendering. And so the, pro the problem is that it overestimates the, 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 the bone loss. Uh, there is bone there. But the problem is that that bone that you're seeing is bundle bone. And so that is tooth dependent bone. If you lost that cuspid, that bundle bone is gone because bundle bone is nothing more than an extension of the periodontal ligament. And so this is a, um, a light polarized light microscopy showing a cross-sectional image. This is bundle bone here. So when you lose this tooth, all this bone is being, is lost. This is where the inserting connective tissue, the fi uh, periodontal ligament fibers uh, uh, insert into the tooth. And this is the residual bone the alveolus that is not bundle bone that can be maintained. That's why there's always some bone changes when teeth are lost. And it's why it's important to do socket preservation surgery uh, augmentation when you lose teeth, particularly if you want to maintain the soft and hard tissue form for, for a patient. But make no mistake, this bone is not savable. Once the tooth is lost, bundle bone, because it's an extension of the, of the periodontal ligament, is going to be compromised or, or lost. And for those of you that are periodontists, if you're talking about taking the American board, this is a question you're going to get. The consequences of tooth movement. There is a regenerative potential in the periosteum, and this was shown back in the 80s with uh, Caring and Neiman's group. And so what they did is they basically took teeth and they pushed them out of the 
bone limit, and then they pushed them back in. And they said, well, is there a regenerative potential in the periosteum? And there is. And so what they showed when they pushed the tooth roots out, and they didn't lose attachment, by the way, is they showed histologically that there was a parallel orientation of the fibers to the tooth root. They showed that you lost facial bone. They showed that there wasn't any attachment loss. In other words, gingival recession didn't develop at least immediately when they moved the teeth and that there were also no Sharpie fibers. And what they also showed is that when you move the teeth back inside the bone envelope, you develop bone. So there was this regenerative potential uh, in the periosteum, in the cambium layer of the periosteum. Today, however, we don't want to push teeth back inside. We don't want to make our box or the oral cavity smaller because we know when we do that, it's giving us less room for the tongue to posture forward. We're only pushing somebody's tongue back into their throat. And they're probably, uh, if they have airway issues, we're, 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 we're setting up conditions that only make their airway conditions perhaps more, more challenging. So I'm not saying that we're going to create uh, conditions we're going to cure sleep apnea. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying as a part of the interdisciplinary dental team, it's our goal to try to do whatever we can do to optimize conditions to improve systemic health care. And that means if patients do have some level of sleep disorder breathing, we want to make the box bigger so that they can posture their tongue forward. Remember, one millimeter of air, one millimeter of change, positive change in the pharyngeal space increases the airfold four times. That's not insignificant. And so we need to do our part as a part of the medical healthcare team to optimize conditions where wherever we have control of the patient. Well, when you do move the teeth in, what happens? This, this scanning, uh, this uh, publication showed that in a, in a patient population that had a class one uh, malocclusion with less than five millimeters of overbite and overjet, when they stripped the teeth and they moved things inside and they, they uh, retracted the teeth, the imaging showed 84% of the mandibular central incisors lost over two millimeters of bone on the lingual. Now I already showed you earlier, one millimeter of bone thickness is normal. Now we've lost two millimeters of bone by orthodontic tooth movement. When we talk about uh, SFOT, we need to think of it in terms of like GBR, GTR. And so there's some differences, which I want to go over with you in terms of wound healing dynamics. When we think about GBR, we have a closed environment for primary wound closure. But when we do SFOT, there's biologic with healing. We don't really have bone healing in, in its primary, in its, in its truest sense. We don't have primary wound closure in its truest sense. It's semi-open in terms of healing. There's a blood clot that's dependent on the seal of the soft tissue flap, right? We have biologic with reformation that has to happen. Whereas with GBR, we have a closed environment. In GBR, meaning there's no tooth there, we're bone grafting for a future implant. There's no micromotion. We have wound stability. But with SFOT, we've got teeth that are moving prior to the bone completely consolidating. So there's some instability of the graft. With GBR, there's space maintenance because we use membranes. Historically, SFOT membranes haven't been used. I always use them, but typically they haven't been used historically. This is an evolution of the topic. With GBR, you got total plaque control at the area and contained wound healing. There's no tooth. There's no plaque in that area. But with SFOT, you've got teeth and you've got orthodontic uh, appliances, more difficult to control plaque, more potential for inflammation to influence wound healing. With GBR, you've got predictable, predictable wound healing when the past principles are followed, meaning primary wound closure, angiogenesis, wound stability, and space maintenance. That's, that's, the, that's the acronym for PASS. And in SFOT, there's more variable and dynamic wound healing uh, potential due to the presence of teeth. And there, there's more wound healing events that are occurring and they're occurring at the same time. Is this PDL influence? <clears throat> Possibly. There's a wonderful oral surgeon by the name Martin Chin who's published in a great book. And he talks about the influence of Sharpie fibers on bone healing. <clears throat> but with SFOT, 100% is, is PDL dependent. You cannot accelerate tooth movement if you have an ankylosed tooth. 
2017, myself and Todd Shire were the co-chairs for the American Academy of Periodontology's best evidence, first ever best evidence consensus on CBCT technology. And it's a couple of the papers that were um, published um, addressed CBCT, but also how does that have a role in assessing risk in dental alveolar changes when, when, when orthodontic tooth movement? And there were five um, dental facial disharmony malocclusions that we identified that can benefit from SFOT, and, and there are here, as you see, and I'll just go over a couple of them. The first one is the transverse maxillary deficiency, the narrow upper arch form, right? And so what happens, the narrow, the jaw is narrow and the teeth compensate, right? And that's what you see. And so what's the orthodontist gonna do first? They're gonna decompensate that. They're gonna reverse the compensations. And so they're gonna do this, right? Because eventually, really what they're thinking is they're gonna set this patient up for a surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion or jaw surgery so they can align things properly, right? But look what happens to the roots the roots are thrown out of the bone. This is what normal is. We would like to have uh, whatever this number is, either from pulp chamber to pulp chamber or CEJ to CEJ or mucogingival junction to mucogingival junction, that number, if that's 30 millimeters, let's say, or 50 or whatever it is, we'd like to have that number X plus five in the upper arch. And so when we look at CBCT technology, even though we may have... Um, a narrow maxilla, we may not have a, an identification of a transverse problem. Again, this is what normal is. And um, without using imaging technology, you're going to miss a lot of the patients that really are, have a deficient maxilla, have a transverse problem, and probably could use really skeletal surgery. Um, and so therefore, it's important to use this information and not just think about it from an implant standpoint, but look at it from a bigger craniofacial standpoint. What this imaging, uh, this paper showed is that patients that don't have crossbites, which is typically the hallmark sign of patients that have a transverse deficiency, can still have a significant discrepancy in the transverse dimension that probably warrants treatment. This is a class two, uh, division two with retroclined upper incisors. This is a patient of mine, VJ. He's seen a number of patients. He's got tra uh, occlusal trauma here. Um, uh, or occlusal traumatism. And, and basically you can see that his bite is basically causing all this gingival recession. Now look at the imaging demonstration. Look at what happens when you look at that from a cross-sectional imaging standpoint. The third pattern is the class two or three with, uh, with maxillary incisor proclination, where you'd like to kind of hold the incisor crown where it is, but you like want to kind of tip the roots out a little bit like that. And in doing so, it may cause problems with the bone deficiency. The interesting thing about this case that I treated is that here's the nasal labial angle, 70.6 degrees. After the treatment that was done with bone grafting, it actually had a positive influence on the nasal labial angle, made it a little more obtuse at 84 degrees. And you can see the thickness in terms of the bone in the lower here versus here as the roots were proclined, as the roots, there was buccal root torque done uh, and the, and the uh, roots were not taken out of the bone, but rather better fortified. You can see that there and there. With the class three uh, patient, um, this is Miguel. This is this patient who has a, has a number of things going on, probably has a bit of a transverse deficiency, class two malocclusion. And look what's happened. I mean, look at the amount of bone around that tooth. What orthodontist would want to move that tooth if they knew that that's what the, the dental alveolar uh, bone volume looked like, right? And this is after treatment. Now, what's wonderful about this is that his phenotype is, is significantly thickened. A lot of the recession is corrected. When we change the crowding issues, notice how thin and how um, minimal the papillas are as you as you gain the arch form, this is gonna change. So you are gonna end up with some black triangles. It's healthy, but we have to make him aware that likely there are gonna be some interproximal spacing and we're gonna to need to have somebody to address these issues uh, if it's a cosmetic or uh, concerned to the patient afterwards. And he's a skeletal patient. We've made a massive improvement in his phenotype periodontally, but he still has an underlying skeletal problem. And so now is the time to do a unilateral surgically assisted rapid palatal expansion and move this segment over. Historically, what happens, periodontist grafts the gum tissue in these areas, gets the roots covered, the orthodontist moves the teeth, 
takes them even further out of the bone. The neurosurgeon corrects the problem orthognathically. And what, what do we end up with? We end up with a patient who is a periodontal annuity for the rest of their life because there isn't bone around the teeth. And this is the patient who is going to relapse, who's going to have gingival recession problems, um, or is going to have coupling problems because we can't really get them to where they, they, they want to be um, unless orthognathics are done. And so here's Miguel. This is where he started. This is what would have happened if we moved the teeth without the corticotomy and bone grafting surgery. And this is what he actually did look like, a much better situation for long-term health for him. These are a couple of articles that, that are kind of supporting what I'm saying. Uh, basically, uh, this article from the Journal of the American Dental Association saying that there's actually, from, from a patient standpoint, um, this perception that taking premolars out of patients and moving everything back actually didn't change their, their facial aesthetic profile at all. And, uh, you know, we've just had four years of Donald Trump in this country. And so I would call this fake news, but nonetheless, it's out there. What about a class two patient who has a severe uh, mandibular deficiency, right? Are we going to correct that mandibular deficiency with dental alveolar surgery? Of course not. We can't fix that with dental alveolar surgery and bone grafting around teeth, it needs to have skeletal surgery. But we can optimize her periodontal health and we can get her to orthognathic surgery even sooner. And so here's the case, thin phenotype, just like I've been showing you. This is why I said don't use a bite fork when you want to uh, take a scan on a patient because you want to see the correct uh, skeletal relationship of the patient. This was my mistake. So today we use a bite registration, fully seated condylar position, normal head position, and then take the imaging so you can see the correct relationship. This is where Aziza, my patient, started. And this is what the orthodontist wants to do. He wants to decompensate the patient because he's going to set her up for a lower jaw surgery, right? But what's going to happen? He's going to take those teeth right out of the bone, right? And that's typically what ends up happening. So what we're going to do is we're going to decompensate her with bone augmentation surgery first and look at how thick the bone is around the teeth. Look at how beautiful that bone is around the teeth. This patient is set up for long-term mucogingival health. She will have a fantastic outcome long-term, but there's an uncoupling here because the decompensation has unmasked the true skeletal etiology of the patient. So now we'll do the lower jaw surgery and look at the change. This is a dramatic change. Look at her face, look at her profile. She's just a beautiful young woman. This looks this looks incredible. And I'm so excited to show you this because this is where all the specialties come together. Pros, perio, oral surgery, orthodontics. Nobody's impinging on somebody's territory. Everybody has their set role to play and, and the patient wins. The patient wins. And that's what happens when we work as a team. And this is a paradigm shift because this is a periodontal surgery, pretty sophisticated one, but one that was that really led orthognathic surgery to get the result that you see here. What about a patient like this? This is a significant transverse deficiency, um, you know, anterior open bite. This patient needs 100% needs orthognathic surgery. But again, he wants to have surgery done with Invisalign. And this is how the case is going to be set up, right? And so Invisalign is going to be done. Again, a cartoon is basically directing skeletal surgery, which I think is a little bit crazy. But because we have the imaging technology and we kind of know where the teeth need to go, we can make some better determinations on really what should happen. So here's the initial CBCT scan. The upper jaw was done with lower with SFOT. You can see the bone augmentation here. You can see how everything was decompensated more ideally. And then here's the scan post-orthognathic surgery. So you can see that the upper jaw SFOT allowed the decompensation to have to happen better, more predictably, and with very better periodontal health. And then the orthognathic surgeon took things to completion. So here's where we started and here's where we finished. He's got good soft tissue volume, but he has deficiencies in bone. And there's only one way to know that, and that's through the imaging technology. There's no way you can end up with a situation like this that isn't going to be a periodontal problem in his future going through all this, going through orthodontics and orthodontic surgery, unless you have the technology to show you uh, that where you want to put those teeth is, is consistent with the bone anatomy that he presents with. And this is where SFOT plays a, plays a big role. So here's a class three skeletal malocclusion. It's a kind of a minor 
a skeletal malocclusion, and you can see the models there. You can see how uh, her, she has a bit of an underbite, and she has a transverse deficiency in the posterior as well. And that's what would happen if we actually corrected her orthodontically. Now, this is a patient you can make an argument to have a skeletal surgery with. Absolutely. She declined that. And so we're going to take a different pathway and try to treat her with, with, um, with, uh, with SFOT surgery. The upper arch is aesthetics. The lower arch is function. And so think of Uvo for a minute as a prosthodontist. He's trying to coordinate the arches and he kind of get the teeth to couple properly. And this is what he faces. He's got the upper arch in the right position, but look at what he's going to have a challenge with, right? And so if you try to put these teeth in this position so that they couple properly and he has good anterior protected articulation, you have a problem now with the amount of bone that's around the teeth, right? Patient in a fully seated condylar position, you've got the teeth in the right position for aesthetics in the maxillary arch. You want to put the teeth in the right spot for function, but there's a deficiency in bone and you can see that here. So now we've gone ahead and done our bone grafting, soft tissue augmentation, buckle root torque to put the roots in the right position to get the teeth to couple properly. And that's what we end up with. That's a much better situation long-term periodontally. And that's a situation in a patient who's going through a full mouth reconstruction where their gingival health is going to uh, hold up when all these crowns are being redone. Now, uh, again, aligning the arches, we may have interproximal papilla issues. That's simple to, to modify, uh, particularly with the talents of restorative and aesthetic dentistry that are available today. And that's something that can be done. And look at the arch form changes, better volume for the tongue, better room, more a broader smile and a more robust smile, something that's more beautiful. You can see that the crossbite has been corrected uh, with the post, uh, post-operative models here, both bilaterally. We've kind of fudged her skeletal problem, but it was certainly one that was better than perhaps going through orthognathic surgery. So we know in terms of the envelope of tooth movement, this shows what can be accomplished with orthodontic treatment alone, with orthodontic treatment and growth modification in a growing child, and then with skeletal surgery. Okay, But with SFOT, I would say this now becomes in the adult patient, the envelope of movement that can be done with SFOT. And again, coupled with orthognathic surgery, the, the outcomes are, are really uh, fantastic. Um, I will show you that, you know, what are the limits? Can we expect the bone to bend? Um, you know, there are studies out there that show you that teeth can move a significant amount. I think we need to be careful with that because this is basically saying that with SFOT, you can protract, not tip, but protract the lower incisor or nine millimeters. I think that's a bit far-fetched. So be careful with what we read. Here's the sure smile diagnostics for Susanna that I showed you earlier, a patient with all that significant crowding. So let's pose the question, can we do the surgery with SFOT and not take any teeth out? Or do we have to take teeth out? And are we still going to have a bone problem? So can we do the case with non-retractive orthodontia, non-extraction, or do we have to take some teeth out? And here's the software program, the CBCT interface with the simulation software program to show the tooth movement. So here is the orthodontist push, positioning the teeth in the right spot for, uh, for coupling and so forth. And you can see the significant uh, amount of tooth movement that wouldn't be needed. Um, this is the extraction retraction uh, plan, taking out the second bicuspids. Now, to put the teeth out this far off the base, there's maybe two people in the world, including God, that can do that. And they don't live in Chicago. So there's no way that this is going to happen in a predictable fashion in my practice. But if we go ahead and extract the teeth, you'll notice there's still a bone problem around the teeth. There's still periodontal vulnerability. So with Susanna's case, we're going to elect for an extraction case with corticotomy treatment. And here's the surgery. So we're gonna take the teeth out. We're gonna remove all resistance to tooth movement. I'm taking out the buccal plate, protecting the foramens, doing the corticotomies, dental alveolar decortication, doing our bone grafting around the teeth. And look what happens. From his baseline, two weeks, four weeks, eight, 16, 22, and by 28 weeks, we have the teeth aligned. We have a beautiful periodontal result. And we have a patient that's incredibly excited about and has really been transformed about what, what she's gone through. How about patients like this? Significant crowding, dental alveolar deficiencies, already presenting with black triangles. You know, how can we move a patient's teeth like this without incurring even more periodontal risk? 
So here's the surgery. Again, we, in some cases, will also use some endogain, but I've done my corticotomies, dental alveolar decortication, endogain, cancellous allograft for periodontal regeneration, cortical cancellous allograft with bioos for my phenotype modification and my uh, bone augmentation, membranes to stabilize the bone graft, passive free wound closure. And you can see the original situation on the left and then the situation on the right. Again, remember the orthodontist now decompensates, right? Here's the bone volume in the maxilla from before to after, so much more bone to move the teeth. But what happens? You unmask the class two skeletal deficiency. And so we have to have a plan now for the lower. Are we gonna dump the lower incisors forward, procline them so that, there's, um, so that the teeth touch? Am I gonna have Uvo maybe platform the linguals of the upper incisors so the teeth won't move? Or better yet, are we gonna do a lower jaw surgery so we, create the, so we treat the core problem of the patient, which is a mandibular deficiency, and we move the lower jaw forward? What about young individuals? Crowding, class three, difficult situation. Today we can even do things before the sutures fuse where we can take a patient like this, and these are the medical models. And so I've done a combination for this young boy. He's about 13. I've done corticotomies and bone grafting of the upper and lower arches to allow the orthodontist to align the teeth. But then I've also put in these skeletal anchor plates, these de Klerk anchor plates in the mandible and in the maxillary arch. And then we're going to use class three elastics because if we can catch this kid during growth, we can help move that maxilla forward and, and perhaps minimize the need for uh, orthodontics down the road. This is a paper that I published in 2013. Basically, it's a, um, it's a classification system to evaluate risk assessment in moving teeth and looking at bone volume from a crestal standpoint, that MP1 level, as well as a radicular standpoint, which is the mid-root position. These are some of the typical phenotypes that you'll see. Um, this is very rare. Uh, but typically the common one is this one where you have a thick, thin phenotype. You have a thick crestal phenotype, but you have a thin radicular uh, dental alveolar bone phenotype. And most of the time we've historically been just looking at the gum tissue in this crestal area saying, hey, everything looks good. There's no recession. Go ahead and move the teeth. And you go ahead and move the teeth and you take the patient who had a risk like this, where this bone was actually protective, and you now transform them to this, which is a very vulnerable, thin crustal thin radicular dental alveolar bone phenotype that really requires bone augmentation and perhaps even soft tissue augmentation. For those of you that are interested in kind of reading up a little bit more about this, this is a paper I published in uh, Compendium. Uh, I actually have a book that's going to be published next year um, uh, by Springer Publishing Company on this topic uh, exclusively. It'll be really great. This is really the rationale in, for which we do the procedure to put the teeth in the right position for facial aesthetics and function, to transform the periodontal phenotype in order to make that happen, and to improve the long-term orthodontic stability and reduce the potential for relapse. We also do it to optimize anterior protected articulation parameters and to optimize airway uh, dimensions with non-retractive orthodontic when possible. It's not always possible. I showed you Su uh, Susanna's case. Um, it's not always possible, but when we have opportunities to prevent teeth from being lost, we should do that. And this is the biggest, you know, this is where prosthodontics is, is really, you know, and this is the difficulty with prosthodontics. You know, they deal with these class two malocclusions all the time and they, they have these coupling problems, right? And so you're gonna platform the linguals, tip the lower for, uh, tooth teeth out, or are we gonna move the lower jaw forward? Well, I'm saying today, let's, Let's get this patient like this and let's actually improve the bone around the teeth at the same time. Let's not, let's not go from here to here. That makes the patient worse periodontally. That doesn't do anybody any good. Let's do that. Let's make their phenotype thick and robust, expand the opportunities for tooth movement and put the patient in a better situation long-term. And so the structures when we treat complex cases, typically the coronal morphology, we can use minimally invasive dentistry for that, the root position, and then the dental alveolar bone. And so historically we've always said, well, we can, we can modify the coronal morphology with crowns, bonding, you know, all the, all the biomimetic principles today. And we can move the roots into a position, but we can't do anything to the dental alveolar bone. That's the historic mindset. Today we flip the script and we say, you know what? That's the most plastic structure in the body is the dental alveolar bone. We can modify that and augment that 
we can put the roots in the right position for the for the for where the crowns need to go and do minimally invasive dentistry. And so let's flip the script. I'm gonna um, try to run through this kind of quickly because I know we're running a little bit out of time. Um, uh, just real quickly, we we originally thought that corticotomies were a bony block movement and that flap surgery, we know that flap surgery does cause some resorption and it stimulates the regional accelerator phenomena. But it wasn't until 2001 when the Wilkos really showed that there was the surgery, you know, resulted in this coupling of demineralization and remineralization that was associated with the regional accelerator phenomena. The regional accelerator phenomena was discovered by a guy named Frost. It basically results in osteopenic bone, similar to a fracture. It upregulates um, vascular neogenesis. It activates normal biologic processes, uh, and it also lasts about 12 weeks. This is what happens from a histologic standpoint. Here's the bone around a, a normal rat tooth. You do the corticotomies. You basically demineralize the bone around the roots of the teeth. That leads to remineralization of the teeth down the road. And so, um, uh, this has been shown in their animal model, not in the human model, but this is effectively what, what happens. And this is a study that was published in AJO, won the Milo Hellman Award, showing that the combination treatment of corticotomies bypassed the lag phase, reduced the risk of hyalinization of the PDL, and is it re re uh, results in a reversible osteopenia with no pathologic loss of bone density mass or volume. In fact, it increases the density. So how much bone injury do we really need? Well, we can't do chicken scratch, which is like I was doing when I first started. We need a little bit more of a shock and awe, okay? And so the, what I'm saying with this is the more the insult around the teeth, like you see on the right, the bigger the regional accelerator phenomena, the more the demineralization around the teeth, the, um, the less resistance to tooth movement. And so here's basically the corticotomies. If you do it just on the buckle, or if you do it on the buckle and the lingual, and essentially that's the demineralized bone matrix that happens with the bone augmentation. If you need a bigger wrap for a bigger tooth movement, you see with uh, corticotomies on both sides, the more the surgical injury, the more the region, regional accelerator phenomena, the more the demineralized bone matrix, and then grafting in the area of tooth movement. And so I'll just kind of run through this, improving the risk assessment for a patient. Again, here's where we start. This is putting the teeth in the right position for facial aesthetics. This is the coupling that has to happen and the vulnerability that happens uh, without thinking about the bone. And this is what we want to achieve. But canine distalization, again, aesthetic crown enhancement needs. I'm gonna take this wedge of bone out. We're gonna uh, do our corticotomy around number six. We're gonna graft with a temporary anchorage device. We're gonna go ahead and move that tooth back. We know that at 30 days, we have bone remodeling, but by 14 days, we have a weak connective tissue attachment. And we can move that cuspid into the right position, set this case up for dynamic navigation surgery, and end up with a very nice result with really good bone around the teeth all the way around in, in doing so. But again, we have to be thinking about coupling. This is the patient in a fully seated condylar position. And still, you know, this requires some work. Unfortunately, that's not still the standard app, modem apparatus with a lot of the orthodontists. And we could take patients that look like this and transform them to this. And it's just a wonderful thing to do. Last case I'll share with you is a combination case, orthodontic surgery, SFOT and PROS. This is Janice. She's got a class two um, inhibitor deficiency. This is the sure smile setup. This is where we wanna put the teeth. There's an obvious problem here. Uh, with the orthodontic setup. So the first thing we're gonna do is, is just do a gingivectomy so that we can bond the brackets in the right spot. We'll then go ahead and do some transitional bonding. I'm gonna go ahead and do my corticotomies, dental alveolar decortication, graft, as I've shown you. We're gonna remove the tori, create a bigger regional accelerator phenomena there, put some tads in, lower arch surgery, bone grafting and membranes, closure, and we go from there to there in the orthodontic setup. Um, with uh, setting her up for orthodontic surgery. Again, buccal root torque, still have a class two problem here, but look at the bone phenotype looking great. And this is the softening of the soft tissue B point that I mentioned earlier. 
We're now going to go ahead and plan for her lower jaw surgery. This is the reentry on the upper arch you see from the SFOT surgery. Look at the beautiful bone that has been created, the functional matrix that's been created. That bone is going to be there long term. It's not going away. We even took a little core out for histology, and you can see the beautiful bone biopsy, the well-integrated bone from Peter Schupach. 69% new vital bone formation with only 25% residual graft, even from micro CT. You can see the beautiful bone. And though this is the orthognathic setup, she had actually had a chin implant. So Dr. Relly in California is going to go ahead and do the lower jaw surgery. And this is the transformation for Janice from here to there and there to there. And all the beautiful prosthodontic work by Brian Bensay and uh, Tadanori Taniguchi. Uh, and this last paper I'd like to show you is a, one we published in uh, as an editorial for in the in the International Journal of Perio and Restorative Dentistry in December. It basically the 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 topic was how well are we ortho, are we diagnosing our orthodontic patients because if we're not thinking about things with a biologic compass and a periodontal conscience we're not doing our patients the best that we that we really can so using the technology today with a biologic compass and a periodontal conscience is really the way in which we want to move forward. And the question that I'll, I have to pose to all of you is after this lecture, hopefully you'll take this back and, and think about things and incorporate this into your practice. But now you know, and if you know, are you going to practice at a different level? Will you continue to practice like yesterday or will you move your practice forward? I hope this was helpful. I hope I didn't go over too much time, Uvo. It's a passion for me. I love doing this work and uh, making these transformations. And I love working with a team and having an impact on people's lives. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share this this morning. I hope it was interesting and thought-provoking. And um, I'll end by saying go blue. All right. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Mandelaris. Uh, I want to find out, do you have any questions? If you have any questions from the uh, in, in the chat, you could put it in. Let us. Um, um, yes, Anin, Anin, uh, I know you are from uh, Iraq. We have a couple people here today. Uh, I know a couple people on on Facebook as well. But if you have any questions, uh, please type it in in the chat. Was there? Um, anyway, this is going to be. I, I know someone sometimes. Um, Sometimes this is, um, it needs, it, it requires you to take a second listen. <laughs> because, uh, but I know for, for many of us, this is uh, entirely new stuff, uh, which is why we want to do these webinars, because uh, the field is advancing. There's so many things going on, and you need to be up to date. And this, so this is, this is just perfect for us uh, that we can learn about um, you know, what, what is new and, and very scientific. Thank you for the details. Uh, this is an amazing. So we're looking forward to uh, uh, next um, next in two weeks' time, I guess. You know, uh, where, where Dr. Mandela is going to be back on a Saturday uh, to continue, um, and uh, I'm going to have this recording available so that we can go back and listen to it. And um, if you have any questions, we can always uh, send those questions via email to Dr. Mandela and in his uh, second lecture. It would, uh, kind of you, a, a you, well, I, I have a question here. The mem so yes, we I use a typically a bioguide membrane. Many of them are the forty by fifty bioguide membranes. They they actually stretch when you when you use them. So the first thing I do is I will tack them down. I use a Meisinger tack. I uh, fixate it, and then I'll kind of pull it over the bone graft and then tack it again in between the teeth. Sometimes we don't. Many times we don't remove them. And sometimes we do. Very simple to remove. You just a little drop of anesthetic. You make a slit in the tissue and pop it out. It's, it's very simple. Not a screw. Okay. You so said, what time do we need uh, after the bone graft to start the orthodontic treatment? So usually the orthodontic treatment, uh, well, so the orthodontic brackets usually go on first or the aligners, everything is kind of ready first. There may be some leveling and aligning that's done first. And then once the surgery occurs, then uh, you want to wait usually about seven to 10, 14 days. Uh, make sure everything looks good. There's no wound healing deficiencies. There's no infection or anything. But now at that time point, you are starting to enter the phase of the regional accelerator phenomena, that demineralized bone matrix. 
um, has just begun. And so now you want to start to move the teeth more, more quickly. So you'll have the orthodontist see the patient every two weeks, every three weeks, and that's the time to start putting in the heavy arch wires and, you know, move away from the round wires and get those rectangular wires in to really start moving the teeth. Or in the case of using aligners, you're going to flip out the aligner trays. You're going to, you know, probably every two or three days, you're changing the aligner trays every two or three days, not every two or three weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mandelaris. Uh, that's, um, um, You're welcome. Thanks, Uvo. Right. Okay. Looking forward to having you uh, uh, next week uh, or two weeks time, right? We have Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-